Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Part 1, Chapter 1 On an exceptionally hot evening early in July, a young man came out of the garret in which he lodged in S. Place and walked slowly as though in hesitation towards K. Bridge. He had successfully avoided meeting his landlady on the staircase. His garret was under the roof of a high, five-storied house and was more like a cupboard than a room. The landlady who provided him with garret, dinners, and attendance lived on the floor below, and every time he went out he was obliged to pass her kitchen, the door of which invariably stood open, and each time he passed the young man had a sick, frightened feeling which made him scowl and feel ashamed. He was hopelessly in debt to his landlady and was afraid of meeting her. This was not because he was cowardly and abject, quite the contrary, but for some time past he had been in an overstrained, irritable condition verging on hypochondria. He had become so completely absorbed in himself and isolated from his fellows that he dreaded meeting not only his landlady, but anyone at all. He was crushed by poverty, but the anxieties of his position had of late ceased to weigh upon him. He had given up attending to matters of practical importance. He had lost all desire to do so. Nothing that any landlady could do had a real terror for him. But to be stopped on the stairs, to be forced to listen to her trivial, irrelevant gossip, to pestering demands for payment, threats and complaints, and to rack his brains for excuses, to prevaricate, to lie, no, rather than that, he would creep down the stairs like a cat and slip out unseen. This evening, however, on coming out into the street, he became acutely aware of his fears. "'I want to attempt a thing like that, and am frightened by these trifles,' he thought, with an odd smile. Mm, "'Yes, all is in a man's hands, and he lets it all slip from cowardice. That's an axiom. It would be interesting to know what it is men are most afraid of. Taking a new step, uttering a new word, is what they fear most. But I am talking too much. It's because I chatter that I do nothing. Or perhaps it is that I chatter because I do nothing.' I've learned to chatter this last month, lying for days together in my den, thinking of Jack the Giant Killer. Why am I going there now? Am I capable of that? Is that serious? It is not serious at all. It is simply a fantasy to amuse myself, a plaything. Yes, maybe it is a plaything. The heat in the street was terrible, and the airlessness, the bustle, and the plaster, scaffolding, bricks, and dust all about him— and that special Petersburg stench, so familiar to all who were unable to get out of town in summer, all worked painfully upon the young man's already overwrought nerves. The insufferable stench from the pothouses, which are particularly numerous in that part of the town, and the drunken men whom he met continually, although it was a working day, completed the revolting misery of the picture. An expression of the profoundest disgust gleamed for a moment in the young man's refined face. He was, by the way, exceptionally handsome, above the average in height, slim, well-built, with beautiful dark eyes and dark brown hair. Soon he sank into deep thought, or, more accurately speaking, into a complete blankness of mind. He walked along, not observing what was about him, and not caring to observe it. From time to time he would mutter something from the habit of talking to himself, to which he had just confessed. At these moments he would become conscious that his ideas were sometimes in a tangle and that he was very weak. For two days he had scarcely tasted food. He was so badly dressed that even a man accustomed to shabbiness would have been ashamed to be seen in the street in such rags. In that quarter of the town, however, scarcely any shortcoming in dress would have created surprise. Owing to the proximity of the haymarket, the number of establishments of bad character— the preponderance of the trading and working-class population crowded in these streets and alleys in the heart of Petersburg, types so various were to be seen in the streets that no figure, however queer, would have caused surprise. But there was such accumulated bitterness and contempt in the young man's heart that, in spite of all the fastidiousness of youth, he minded his rags least of all in the street. It was a different matter when he met with acquaintances or with former fellow-students, whom indeed he disliked meeting at any time, and yet— when a drunken man, who, for some unknown reason, was being taken somewhere in a huge wagon dragged by a heavy dray horse, suddenly shouted at him as he drove past, "'Hey there, German hatter!' bawling at the top of his voice and pointing at him, the young man stopped suddenly and clutched tremulously at his hat. It was a tall, round hat from Zimmerman's, but completely worn out, 
rusty with age, all torn and bespattered, brimless, and bent on one side in a most unseemly fashion. Not shame, however, but quite another feeling akin to terror had overtaken him. "'I knew it,' he muttered in confusion. "'I thought so. That's the worst of all. Why, a stupid thing like this, the most trivial detail might spoil the whole plan. Yes, my hat is too noticeable. It looks absurd, and that makes it noticeable. With my rags I ought to wear a cap and a sort of old pancake, but not this grotesque thing. Nobody wears such a hat it would be noticed a mile off. It would be remembered. What matters is that people would remember it, and that would give them a clue. For this business one should be as little conspicuous as possible. Trifles. Trifles are what matter. Why, it's just such trifles that always ruin everything. He had not far to go. He knew indeed how many steps it was from the gate of his lodging house. Exactly seven hundred and thirty. He had counted them once when he had been lost in dreams. At the time he had put no faith in those dreams and was only tantalizing himself by their hideous but daring recklessness. Now, a month later, he had begun to look upon them differently, and in spite of the monologues in which he jeered at his own impotence and indecision, he had involuntarily come to regard this hideous dream as an exploit to be attempted, although he still did not realize this himself. He was positively going now for a rehearsal of his project, and, at every step, his excitement grew more and more violent. With a sinking heart and a nervous tremor, he went up to a huge house which on one side looked on to the canal, and on the other into the street. This house was let out in tiny tenements, and was inhabited by working people of all kinds, tailors, locksmiths, cooks, Germans of sorts, girls picking up a living as best they could, petty clerks, and so forth. There was a continual coming and going through the two gates and in the two courtyards of the house. Three or four doorkeepers were employed on the building. The young man was very glad to meet none of them, and at once slipped unnoticed through the door on the right and up the staircase. It was a back staircase, dark and narrow, but he was familiar with it already and knew his way, and he liked all these surroundings. In such darkness even the most inquisitive eyes were not to be dreaded. If I am so scared now, what would it be if it somehow came to pass that I were really going to do it? He could not help asking himself as he reached the fourth story. There his progress was barred by some porters who were engaged in moving furniture out of a flat. He knew that the flat had been occupied by a German clerk in the civil service and his family. This German was moving out then, and so the fourth floor on this staircase would be untenanted except by an old woman. "'That's a good thing anyway,' he thought to himself as he rang the bell of the old woman's flat. The bell gave a faint tinkle, as though it were made of tin and not of copper. The little flats in such houses always have bells that ring like that. He had forgotten the note of that bell, and now its peculiar tinkle seemed to remind him of something and to bring it clearly before him. He started. His nerves were terribly overstrained by now. In a little while the door was opened a tiny crack. The old woman eyed her visitor with evident distrust through the crack, and nothing could be seen but her little eyes glittering in the darkness. But, seeing a number of people on the landing, she grew bolder and opened the door wide. The young man stepped into the dark entry, which was partitioned off from the tiny kitchen. The old woman stood facing him in silence and looked inquiringly at him. She was a diminutive, withered-up old woman of sixty, with sharp, malignant eyes and a sharp little nose. Her colorless, somewhat grizzled hair was thickly smeared with oil, and she wore no kerchief over it. Round her thin long neck, which looked like a hen's leg, was knotted some sort of flannel rag, and in spite of the heat there hung flapping on her shoulders a mangy fur cape, yellow with age. The old woman coughed and groaned at every instant. The young man must have looked at her with a rather peculiar expression, for a, a gleam of mistrust came into her eyes again. Raskolnikov, a student I came here a month ago, the young man made haste to mutter, with a half-bow, remembering that he ought to be more polite. "'I remember, my good sir. I remember quite well your coming here,' the old woman said distinctly, still keeping her inquiring eyes on his face. "'And here I am again on the same errand,' Raskolnikov continued, a little disconcerted and surprised at the old woman's mistrust. "'Perhaps she is always like that, though, only I did not notice it the other time,' he thought with an uneasy feeling." The old woman paused, as though hesitating. 
then stepped on one side, and pointing to the door of the room, she said, letting her visitor pass in front of her, "'Step in, my good sir.' The little room into which the young man walked, with yellow paper on the walls, geraniums, and muslin curtains in the windows, was brightly lighted up at that moment by the setting sun. "'So the sun will shine like this then, too,' flashed, as it were by chance, through Raskolnikov's mind, and with a rapid glance he scanned everything in the room, trying as far as possible to notice and remember its arrangement. But there was nothing special in the room. The furniture, all very old and of yellow wood, consisted of a sofa with a huge bent wooden back, an oval table in front of the sofa, a dressing-table with a looking-glass fixed on it between the windows, chairs along the walls, and two or three halfpenny prints in yellow frames, representing German damsels with birds in their hands. That was all. In the corner a light was burning before a small icon. Everything was very clean. The floor and the furniture were brightly polished. Everything shone. Lisevette's work, thought the young man. There was not a speck of dust to be seen in the whole flat. "'It's in the houses of spiteful old widows that one finds such cleanliness,' Raskolnikov thought again, and he stole a curious glance at the cotton curtain over the door leading into another tiny room, in which stood the old woman's bed and chest of drawers, and to which he had never looked before. These two rooms made up the whole flat. "'What do you want?' the old woman said severely, coming into the room, and, as before, standing in front of him so as to look him straight in the face. "'I have brought something to pawn here.' and he drew out of his pocket an old-fashioned flat silver watch, on the back of which was engraved a globe. The chain was of steel. "'But the time is up for your last pledge. The month was up the day before yesterday.' "'I will bring you the interest for another month. Wait a little.' "'But that's for me to do as I please, my good sir, to wait or to sell your pledge at once.' "'How much will you give me for the watch, Alyona Ivanova?' "'You come with such trifles, my good sir. "'It's scarcely worth anything. "'I gave you two roubles last month for your ring, "'and one could buy it quite new at a jeweler's "'for a rouble and a half. "'Give me four roubles for it. "'I shall redeem it. It was my father's. "'I shall be getting some money soon. "'A rouble and a half, and interest in advance, if you like.' "'A rouble and a half!' cried the young man. "'Please yourself!' "'And the old woman handed him back the watch.' The young man took it, and was so angry that he was on the point of going away, but checked himself at once, remembering that there was nowhere else he could go, and that he had had another object also in coming. "'Hand the dover,' he said roughly. The old woman fumbled in her pocket for her keys, and disappeared behind the curtain into the other room. The young man, left standing alone in the middle of the room, listened inquisitively, thinking. He could hear her unlocking the chest of drawers." "'It must be the top drawer,' he reflected. "'So she carries the keys in a pocket on the right, "'all in one the bunch on a steel ring. "'And there's one key there, three times as big as all the others, with deep notches. "'That can't be the key of the chest of drawers. "'Then there must be some other chest or strong box. "'That's worth knowing. "'Strong boxes always have keys like that. "'But how degrading it all is!' "'The old woman came back. "'Here, sir!' As we say, ten kopecks to rouble a month, so I must take fifteen kopecks from a rouble and a half for the month in advance. But for the two roubles I lent you before, you owe me now twenty kopecks on the same reckoning in advance. That makes thirty-five kopecks altogether. So I must give you a rouble and fifteen kopecks for the watch. Here it is. What? Only a rouble and fifteen kopecks now? Just so. The young man did not dispute it, and took the money. He looked at the old woman, and was in no hurry to get away, as though there was still something he wanted to say or to do, but he did not himself quite know what. "'I may be bringing you something else in a day or two, Alyona Ivanova. A valuable thing. Silver. A cigarette box. As soon as I get it back from a friend,' he broke off in confusion. "'Well, we will talk about it then, sir.' "'Good-bye. Are you always at home alone? Your sister is not here with you?' he asked her as casually as possible as he went out into the passage. "'What the business is she of yours, my good sir?' "'Oh, no, nothing particular. I simply asked. You are too quick. Good day, Alyona Ivanova.' Raskolnikov went out in complete confusion. 
This confusion became more and more intense. As he went down the stairs, he even stopped short two or three times, as though suddenly struck by some thought. When he was in the street, he cried out, "'Oh, God, how loathsome it all is, and can I? "'Can I possibly? No. "'No, it's nonsense, it's rubbish,' he added resolutely. "'And how could such an atrocious thing come into my head? "'What filthy things my heart is capable of? "'Yes, filthy above all, disgusting, loathsome, loathsome, "'and for a whole month I've been.' "'But no words, no exclamations could express his agitation.' The feeling of intense repulsion which had begun to oppress and torture his heart while he was on his way to the old woman had by now reached such a pitch and had taken such a definite form that he did not know what to do with himself to escape from his wretchedness. He walked along the pavement like a drunken man, regardless of the passers-by, and jostling against them, and only came to his senses when he was in the next street. Looking round, he noticed that he was standing close to a tavern which was entered by steps leading from the pavement to the basement. At that instant, two drunken men came out at the door, and, abusing and supporting one another, they mounted the steps. Without stopping to think, Raskolnikov went down the steps at once. Till that moment, he had never been into a tavern, but now he felt giddy and was tormented by a burning thirst. He longed for a drink of cold beer, and attributed his sudden weakness to the want of food. He sat down at a sticky little table in a dark and dirty corner, ordered some beer, and eagerly drank off the first glassful. At once he felt easier, and his thoughts became clear. "'All that is nonsense,' he said, hopefully, "'and there is nothing in it at all to worry about. It's simply physical derangement. Just a glass of beer, a piece of dry bread, and in one moment the brain is stronger, the mind is clearer, and the will is firm. Who?' "'How utterly petty it all is!' "'But in spite of this scornful reflection, "'he was by now looking cheerful "'as though he were suddenly set free from a terrible burden, "'and he gazed round in a friendly way "'at the people in the room. "'But even at that moment "'he had a dim foreboding "'that this happier frame of mind "'was also not normal. "'There were a few people at the time in the tavern. "'Besides the two drunken men "'he had met on the steps, "'a group consisting of about five men and a girl with a concertina had gone out at the same time. Their departure left the room quiet and rather empty. The persons still in the tavern were a man who appeared to be an artisan, drunk, but not extremely so, sitting before a pot of beer, and his companion, a huge, stout man with a grey beard, in a short, full-skirted coat. He was very drunk, and had dropped asleep on the bench. Every now and then he began, as though in his sleep, cracking his fingers, with his arms wide apart and the upper part of his body bounding about on the bench, while he hummed some meaningless refrain, trying to recall some such lines as these. His wife a year, he fondly love his wife a year, he fondly love. Or suddenly, waking up again, walking along the crowded row, he met the one he used to know. But no one shared his enjoyment. His silent companion looked with positive hostility and mistrust at all these manifestations. There was another man in the room who looked somewhat like a retired government clerk. He was sitting apart now and then, sipping from his pot, and looking round at the company. He, too, appeared to be in some agitation. The End of Part 1, Chapter 1 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Read by Rick Kirchner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Part 1, Chapter 2 Raskolnikov was not used to crowds, and, as we said before, he avoided society of every sort, more especially of late. But now all at once he felt a desire to be with other people. Something new seemed to be taking place within him, and with it he felt a sort of thirst for company. He was so weary after a whole month of concentrated wretchedness and gloomy excitement that he longed to rest, if only for a moment, in some other world, whatever it might be. And in spite of the filthiness of his surroundings, he was glad now to stay in the tavern. The master of the establishment was in another room, but he frequently came down some steps into the main room, his jaunty tarred boots with red turnover tops coming into view each time before the rest of his person. He wore a full coat and a horribly greasy black satin waistcoat with no cravat, and his whole face seemed smeared with oil like an iron lock. 
At the counter stood a boy of about fourteen, and there was another boy, somewhat younger, who handed whatever was wanted. On the counter lay some sliced cucumbers, some pieces of dried black bread, and some fish, chopped up small, all smelling very bad. It was insufferably close, and so heavy with the fumes of spirits that five minutes in such an atmosphere might well make a man drunk. There are chance meetings with strangers that interest us from the first moment before a word is spoken. Such was the impression made on Raskolnikov by the person sitting a little distance from him, who looked like a retired clerk. The young man often recalled this impression afterwards, and even ascribed it to presentiment. He looked repeatedly at the clerk, partly, no doubt, because the latter was staring persistently at him, obviously anxious to enter into conversation. At the other persons in the room, including the tavern-keeper, the clerk looked as though he were used to their company, and weary of it, showing a shade of condescending contempt for them, as persons of station and culture inferior to his own, with whom it would be useless for him to converse. He was a man over fifty, bald and grizzled, of medium height, and stoutly built. His face, bloated from continual drinking, was of a yellow, even greenish tinge, with swollen eyelids out of which keen reddish eyes gleamed like little chinks. But there was something very strange in him. There was a light in his eyes, as though of intense feeling. Perhaps there were even thought and intelligence. But at the same time there was a gleam of something like madness. He was wearing an old and hopelessly ragged black dress coat, with all its buttons missing except one— and that one he had buttoned, evidently clinging to this last trace of respectability. A crumpled shirt-front, covered with spots and stains, protruded from his canvas waistcoat. Like a clerk he wore no beard nor moustache, but had been so long unshaven that his chin looked like a stiff greyish brush. And there was something respectable and like an official about his manner, too. But he was restless. He ruffled up his hair, and from time to time let his head drop into his hands, dejectedly resting his ragged elbows on the stained and sticky table. At last he looked straight at Raskolnikov, and said loudly, and resolutely, "'May I venture, honoured sir, to engage you in the polite conversation? For as much as though your exterior would not command respect, my experience admonishes me that you are a man of education and not accustomed to drinking. I have always respected education when in conjunction with genuine sentiments, and I am besides a titular counsellor in rank. Mamelodov, such is my name, titular counsellor, I make bold to inquire, have you been in the service? No, I am studying, answered the young man, somewhat surprised at the grandiloquent style of the speaker, and also at being so directly addressed. "'in spite of the momentary desire he had just been feeling for company of any sort, "'on being actually spoken to, he felt immediately his habitual, irritable, and uneasy aversion "'for any stranger who approached or attempted to approach him. "'A student, then, or oh, formerly a student,' cried the clerk. Uh, "'Just what I thought. I am a man of experience, immense experience, sir.' "'And he tapped his forehead with his fingers in self-approval. "'You've been... "'a student, or have attended some learned institution. "'But, uh, allow me.' "'He got up, staggered, took up his jug and glass, "'and sat down beside the young man, facing him a little sideways. "'He was drunk, but spoke fluently and boldly, "'only occasionally losing the thread of his sentences "'and drawling his words. "'He pounced upon Raskolnikov as greedily as though he had not "'spoken to a soul for a month. "'Honoured, sir,' he began almost with solemnity, "'Poverty is not a vice. That's a true saying. Yet I know, too, that drunkenness is not a virtue, and that that's even truer. But beggary, honoured sir, beggary is a vice. In the poverty you may still retain your innate nobility of soul, but in beggary never. No one. For beggary a man is not chased out of human society with a stick. He is swept out with a broom, so as to make it as humiliating as possible.' "'And quite right, too, for much as in beggary I am ready to be the first to humiliate myself. "'Hence, depart house. "'Honoured sir, a month ago Mr. Lebeziatnikov gave my wife a beating, "'and my wife is a very different matter from me. "'Do you understand? Uh, "'Allow me to ask you another question out of simple curiosity. "'Have you ever spent a night on a hay barge on the Neva?' "'No, I have not happened to.' "'answered Raskolnikov. "'What do you mean?' "'Well, I, I've just come from one, "'and it's the fifth night I've slept, so... Uh, "'He filled his glass, emptied it, and paused. 
Bits of hay were, in fact, clinging to his clothes and sticking to his hair. It seemed quite probable that he had not undressed or washed for the last five days. His hands particularly were filthy. They were fat and red with black nails. His conversation seemed to excite a general, though languid, interest. The boys at the counter fell to sniggering. The innkeeper came down from the upper room, apparently on purpose to listen to the funny fellow, and sat down at a little distance, yawning lazily, but with dignity. Evidently, Mamelodov was a familiar figure here, and he had most likely acquired his weakness for high-flown speeches from the habit of frequently entering into conversation with strangers of all sorts in the tavern. This habit develops into a necessity in some drunkards, and especially in those who are looked after sharply and kept in order at home. Hence, in the company of other drinkers, they try to justify themselves and, even if possible, obtain consideration. "'Funny fellow,' pronounced the innkeeper. "'And why don't you work? Why aren't you at your duty if you are in the service?' "'Why I am not at my duty, honoured sir,' Mamelodov went on, addressing himself exclusively to Raskolnikov, as though it had been he who put that question to him. "'Why am I not at my duty? Does not my heart ache to think what a useless worm I am? A month ago, when Mr. Lebeznyatnikov beat my wife with his own hands and I lay drunk, didn't I suffer?' "'Excuse me, young man. Has it ever happened to you, hmm? "'Well, to petition hopelessly for a loan.' "'Yes, it has. But what do you mean by hopelessly?' "'Hopelessly in the fullest sense, when you know beforehand that you will get nothing by it. "'You know, for instance, beforehand, with positive certainty, "'that this man, this most reputable and exemplary citizen, "'will on no consideration give you money. "'And indeed, I ask you, why should he?' "'for he knows, of course, that I shan't pay it back. "'From compassion? "'But Mr. Lebeziatnikov, who keeps up with modern ideas, "'explained the other day that compassion is forbidden nowadays by science itself, "'and that that's what is done now in England where there is political economy. "'Why, I ask you, should he give it to me? "'And yet, though I know beforehand that he won't, "'I set off to him and... "'Why do you go?' put in Raskolnikov. "'Well... "'When one has no one, nowhere else one can go. "'For every man must have somewhere to go, "'since there are times when one absolutely must go somewhere. "'When my own daughter first went out with the yellow ticket, "'then I had to go, for my daughter has a yellow passport,' "'he added in parenthesis, looking with a certain uneasiness at the young man. "'No matter, sir, no matter.' "'He went on hurriedly and with apparent composure "'when both the boys at the counter guffawed, "'and even the innkeeper smiled.' "'No matter. I am not confounded by the wagging of their heads, "'for everyone knows everything about it already, "'and all that is secret is made open, "'and I accept it all not with contempt, but with humility. "'So be it. So be it. Behold the man. "'Excuse me, young man, can you... Uh, uh, "'No, to put it more strongly and more distinctly, "'not can you, but dare you, looking upon me, "'assert that I am not a pig.' The young man did not answer a word. Well, the orator began again stolidly, and with even increased dignity, after waiting for the laughter in the room to subside. Well, so be it. I am a pig, but she is a lady. I have the semblance of a beast, but Katerina Ivanova, her, my spouse, is a person of education and an officer's daughter. Granted, granted, I am a scoundrel. "'but she is a woman of a noble heart, "'full of sentiments refined by education, "'and yet, oh, if only she felt for me. "'Honoured, sir, honoured, sir, "'you know every man ought to have at least one place "'where people feel for him. "'But Katerina Ivanova, though she is magnanimous, "'she is unjust, and yet, although I realise "'that when she pulls my hair she only does it out of pity, "'for I repeat, without being ashamed, "'she pulls my hair, young man,' "'he declared with redoubled dignity, "'hearing the sniggering again.' "'But, my God, if she would but once... "'But no, no, it's all in vain, and it's no use talking, no use talking. "'For more than once my wish did come through, "'and more than once she has felt for me, "'but such is my fate, and I am a beast by nature.' "'Rather,' assented the innkeeper, yawning, "'Mamelodov struck his fist resolutely on the table. "'Such is my fate. Do you know, sir, do you know?' "'I have sold her very stockings for drink. "'Not for shoes, that would be more or less in the order of things. 
but her stockings. Her stockings I have sold for drink. Her mohair shawl I sold for drink. A present to her long ago. Her own property, not mine. And we live in a cold room, and she caught cold this winter, and has begun coughing and spitting blood too. We have three little children, and Katerina Ivanova is at work from morning to night. She is scrubbing and cleaning and washing the children, for she's been used to cleanliness from a child. But her chest is weak, and she has a tendency to consumption, and I feel it. Do you suppose I don't feel it? And the more I drink, the more I feel it. That's why I drink too. I try to find sympathy and feeling in drink. I drink so that I may suffer twice as much. And as though in despair, he laid his head down on the table. Young man, he went on, raising his head again. In your face, I seem to read some trouble of mind. When you came in, I read it. And that was why I addressed you at once, for in unfolding to you the story of my life, I do not wish to make myself a laughing stock before these idle listeners, who indeed know all about it already. But I am looking for a man of feeling and education. Know then that my wife was educated in a high-class school for the daughters of noblemen, and on leaving she danced the shawl dance before the governor and other personages for which she was presented with a gold medal and the certificate of merit. The medal, heh, <laughs> well, the medal, of course, was sold long ago, hmm, <laughs> ha. But the certificate of merit is in her trunk still, and not long ago she showed it to our landlady. And although she is most continually on bad terms with the landlady, yet she wanted to tell someone or other of her past honours and of the happy days that are gone. I don't condemn her for it. I don't blame her, for the one thing left is her recollection of the past, and all the rest is dust and ashes.' "'Yes, yes, she is a lady of spirit, proud and determined. "'She scrubs the floors herself and has nothing but black bread to eat, "'but won't allow herself to be treated with disrespect. "'That's why she would not overlook Mr. Lebeziatnikov's rudeness to her, "'and so when he gave her a beating for it, "'she took to her bed more from the hurt to her feelings than from the blows. "'She was a widow when I married her, with three children, "'one smaller than the other.' She married her first husband, an infantry officer, for love, and ran away with him from her father's house. She was exceedingly fond of her husband, but he gave way to cards, got into trouble, and with that he died. He used to beat her at the end, and although she paid him back, of which I have authentic documentary evidence, to this day she speaks of him with tears, and she throws him up to me, (laughs) and I am glad." I am glad that, though only in imagination, she should think of herself as having once been happy. And she was left at his death with three children in a wild and remote district where I happened to be at the time. And she was left in such hopeless poverty that, although I have seen many ups and downs of all sorts, I don't feel equal to describing it even. Her relations had all thrown her off. "'And she was proud, too, excessively proud, "'and then uh, honoured, sir, and then I, uh, "'being at the time a widower with a daughter of fourteen, "'left me by my first wife, "'offered her my hand, for I could not bear the sight of such suffering. "'You can judge the extremity of her calamities "'that she, a woman of education and culture and distinguished family, "'should have consented to be my wife. "'But she did, weeping, and sobbing and wringing her hands she married me, for she had nowhere to turn. Do you understand, sir? Do you understand what it means when you have absolutely nowhere to turn? No, that you don't understand yet, and for a whole year I performed my duties conscientiously and faithfully, and did not touch this. He tapped the jug with his finger, for I have feelings, but even so I could not please her. And then I lost my place too, and that through no fault of mine, but through changes in the office. And then I did touch it. It will be a year and a half ago soon since we found ourselves at last after many wanderings and numerous calamities in this magnificent capital adorned with innumerable monuments. Here I obtained a situation. I obtained it, and I lost it again. Do you understand? Uh, This time it was through my own fault I lost it, for my weakness had come out. "'We have now part of a room at Amalia Fyodorovna Lipiveshul's, "'and what we live upon and what we pay our rent with I could not say. "'There are a lot of people living there beside ourselves. "'Dirt, 
and disorder, a perfect bedlam, hmm? Yes. And meanwhile, my daughter by my first wife has grown up, and what my daughter has had to put up with from her stepmother while she was growing up I won't speak of, for though Katerina Ivanova is full of generous feelings, she is a spirited lady, irritable and short-tempered, yes, but it's no use going over that. Sonia, as you may well fancy, has had no education. I did make an effort four years ago to give her a course of geography and universal history, but as I was not very well up in those subjects myself, and we had no suitable books, and what books we had, <laughs> well, anyway, we have not even those now, so all our instruction came to an end. We stopped at Cyrus of Persia. Since she has attained years of maturity, she has read other books of romantic tendency, and of late she has read with great interest a book she got through Mr. Lebeziatnikov's Lou's Physiology. Do you know it? And even recounted extracts from it to us. And that's the whole of her education. And now, may I venture to address you, honoured sir, on my own account, with a private question. Do you suppose that a respectable poor girl can earn much by honest work? Not fifteen farthings a day can she earn if she is respectable and has no special talent, and that without putting her work down for an instant. And what's more, Ivan Ivanich Klopstock, the civil councillor, have you heard of him, has not to this day paid her for the half-dozen linen shirts she made him and drove her roughly away, stamping and reviling her on the pretext that the shirt collars were not made like the pattern and were put in askew. And there are the little ones, hungry." and Katerina Ivanova walking up and down and wringing her hands, her cheeks flushed red as they always are in that disease. Here, you live with us, says she. You eat and drink and are kept warm and you do nothing to help. And much she gets to eat and drink when there is not a crust for the little ones for three days. I was lying at the time. Well, what of it? I was lying drunk, and I heard my Sonia speaking. She is a gentle creature with a soft little voice, fair hair, at such a pale, thin little face. She said, Katerina Ivanova, am I really to do a thing like that? And Darya Fransovna, a woman of evil character and very well known to the police, had two or three times tried to get at her through the landlady. And why not, said Katerina Ivanova with a jeer. You are something mighty precious to be so careful of. But don't blame her. Don't blame her, honoured sir. Don't blame her. She was not herself when she spoke but driven to distraction by her illness and the crying of the hungry children. And it was said more to wound her than anything else, for that's Katerina Ivanova's character. And when children cry, even from hunger, she falls to beating them at once. At six o'clock I saw Sonia get up, put on her kerchief and her cape, and go out of the room, and about nine o'clock she came back. She walked straight up to Katerina Ivanova, and she laid thirty rubles on the table before her in silence. She did not utter a word. She did not even look at her. She simply picked up our big green drap de dame shawl. Uh, We have a shawl made of drap de dame. Uh, Put it over her head and face, and lay down on the bed with her face to the wall. Only her little shoulders and her body kept shuddering. And I went on lying there, uh, just as before. And then I saw a young man, I saw Katerina Ivanova, in the same silence, go up to Sonia's little bed. She was on her knees all the evening, kissing Sonia's feet, and would not get up, and then they both fell asleep in each other's arms, together. Together, yes, and I lay drunk. Mamelodov stopped short, as though his voice had failed him. Then he hurriedly filled his glass, drank, and cleared his throat. "'Since then, sir,' he went on after a brief pause, "'since then, owing to an unfortunate occurrence "'and through information given by evil-intentioned persons, "'in all which Daria Fransovna took a leading part "'on the pretext that she had been treated with want of respect, "'since then my daughter Sofia Semyonovna "'has been forced to take a yellow ticket, "'and owing to that she is unable to go on living with us.' for our landlady Amalia Fyodorovna would not hear of it, though she had backed up Darya Fatsovna before. And Mr. Lebesnyatnikov, too, hmm? All the trouble between him and Katerina Ivanova was on Sonia's account. At first he was for making up to Sonia himself, and then all of a sudden he stood on his dignity. How? 
said he. Can a highly educated man like me live in the same rooms with a girl like that? And Katerina Ivanovna would not let it pass. She stood up for her, and so that's how it happened. And Sonia comes to us now mostly after dark. She comforts Katerina Ivanovna and gives her all she can. She has a room at the Kapanomov's, the tailor's. She lodges with them. Kapanomov is a lame man with a cleft palate, and all of his numerous family have cleft palates too. And his wife, too, has a cleft palate. They all live in one room. But Sonia has her own, partitioned off. Hmm? Yes, very poor people, and all with cleft palates. Yes. Uh, then I got up in the morning and put on my rags, lifted up my hands to heaven, and set off to His Excellency Ivan Afanasyevich. His Excellency Ivan Afanasyevich, do you know him? Uh, no. Well, then, it's a man of God you don't know. He is wax, wax before the face of the Lord, even as wax melteth. His eyes were dim when he heard my story. My Belladov, once already you have deceived my expectations. I'll take you once more on my own responsibility. That's what he said. Remember, he said, and now you can go. I kissed the dust at his feet, in thought only, for in reality he would have not allowed me to do it, <laughs> being a statesman and a man of modern political and enlightened ideas. I returned home, and when I announced that I'd been taken back into the service and should receive a salary, heavens, what a to-do there was! My Melodov stopped again in a violent excitement. At that moment, a whole party of revellers already drunk came in from the street, and the sounds of a hired concertina and the cracked piping voice of a child of seven singing the hamlet were heard in the entry. The room was filled with noise. The tavern keeper and the boys were busy with the newcomers. Mamelodov, paying no attention to the new arrivals, continued his story. He appeared by now to be extremely weak, but as he became more and more drunk, he became more and more talkative. The recollection of his recent success in getting the situation seemed to revive him, and was positively reflected in a sort of radiance on his face. Raskolnikov listened attentively. "'That was five weeks ago, sir, yes. As soon as Katerina Ivanova and Sonia heard of it, mercy on us, it was as though I stepped into the kingdom of heaven. It used to be, you can lie like a beast, nothing but abuse. Now—' They were walking on tiptoe, hushing the children. Semyon Zaharovich is tired with his work at the office. He is resting. Shh! They made me coffee before I went to work and boiled cream for me. They began to get real cream for me. Do you hear that? And how they managed to get together the money for a decent outfit. Eleven rubles, fifty kopecks, I can't guess. Boots, cotton, shirt fronts, most magnificent. A uniform. They caught up all in splendid style for eleven rubles and a half. The first morning I came back from the office, I found Katerina Ivanova had cooked two courses for dinner, soup and salt meat with horseradish, which we had never dreamed of till then. She had not any dresses, none at all, but she got herself up as though she were going on a visit, and not that she'd anything to do with it. She smartened herself up with nothing at all, she done her hair nicely, put on a clean collar of some sort, cuffs, and there she was, quite a different person. She was younger and better looking. Sonia, my little darling, had only helped with money for the time, she said. It won't do for me to come and see you too often. After dark, maybe, when no one can see. Do you hear? Do you hear? I'll lay down for a nap after dinner, and what do you think? though Katerina Ivanova had quarrelled to the last degree with our landlady Amalia Fedorovna, only a week before she could not resist then asking her in to coffee. For two hours they were sitting, whispering together, Semyon Zaharovich is in the service again now, and receiving a salary, says she. And they went himself to his excellency, and his excellency himself came out to him, made all the others wait, and led Semyon Zaharovich by the hand before everybody into his study. Do you hear? Do you hear? To be sure, says he, Semyon Zaharovich, remembering your past services, says he, and in spite of your propensity to that foolish weakness, since you promise now and since moreover we've got on badly without you. Do you hear? Do you hear? And so, says he, I rely now on your word as a gentleman. And all that, let me tell you, she has simply made up for herself and not simply out of wantonness for the sake of bragging. No, she believes it all herself. She amuses herself with her own fancies. Upon my word, she does. 
and I don't blame her for it. No, I don't blame her. Six days ago, when I brought her my first earnings in full, twenty-three roubles, forty kopecks altogether, she called me her puppet. Puppet, said she, my little puppet. And then we were by ourselves, you understand. You would not think me a beauty. You would not think much of me as a husband, would you? Well, she pinched my cheek. My little puppet, said she. My Melodov broke off, tried to smile, but suddenly his chin began to twitch. He controlled himself, however. The tavern, the degraded appearance of the man, the five nights in the hay barge and the pot of spirits, and yet this poignant love for his wife and children bewildered his listener. Raskolnikov listened intently, but with a sick sensation. He felt vexed that he had come here. "'Honoured, sir! Honoured, sir!' cried Mamelodov, recovering himself. "'Oh, sir, perhaps all this seems a laughing matter to you as it does to others, and perhaps I am only worrying you with the stupidity of all the trivial details of my home life, but it is not a laughing matter to me, for I can feel it all, and the whole of that heavenly day of my life and the whole of that evening I passed in fleeting dreams of how I would arrange it all and how I would dress all the children and how I should give her rest and how I should rescue my own daughter from dishonor and restore her to the bosom of her family, and a great deal more. Quite excusable, sir. Well then, sir, Mamelodov suddenly gave a sort of start raised his head and gazed intently at his listener. Well, on the very next day, after all those dreams, that is to say, exactly five days ago, in the evening, by a cunning trick like a thief in the night, I stole from Katerina Ivanova the key of her box, took out what was left of my earnings, how much it was I have forgotten, and now, look at me, all of you. It's the fifth day since I left home, and they are looking for me there, and it's the end of my employment, and my uniform is lying in a tavern on the Egyptian bridge. I exchanged it for the garments I have on, and it's the end of everything. Mamelodov struck his forehead with his fist, clenched his teeth, closed his eyes, and leaned heavily with his elbow on the table. But a minute later his face suddenly changed, and with a certain assumed slyness and affectation of bravado, he glanced at Raskolnikov, laughed, and said, "'This morning I went to see Sonya. I went to ask her for a pick-me-up. Oh, uh, you don't say she gave it to you,' cried one of the newcomers. He shouted the words and went off into a guffaw. "'This very court was bought with her money,' Mamelodov declared, addressing himself exclusively to Raskolnikov. Thirty kopecks she gave me, with her own hands, her last, all she had, as I saw. She said nothing. She only looked at me without a word. Not on earth. But up yonder, they grieve over men, they, they weep. But they don't blame them. They don't blame them. But it hurts more. It hurts more when they don't blame. Thirty kopecks, yes, and maybe she needs them now, eh? Huh? What do you think, my dear sir? For now, she's got to keep up her appearance. It costs money, that smartness, that special smartness, you know. Do you understand? And there's pomadam, too. Uh, you see, she must have things. Uh, petticoats, starched ones. Shoes, too. Real jaunty ones to show off her foot when she has to step over a puddle. Do you understand, sir? Do you understand what all that smartness means? And here, I... Her own father. Here, I took thirty kopecks of that money for a drink, and I am drinking it, and I have already drunk it. Come, who will have pity on a man like me, eh? Are you sorry for me, sir, or not? Tell me, sir. Are you sorry or not? <laughs> he would have filled his glass, but there was no drink left. The pot was empty. What are you to be pitied for? shouted the tavern keeper, who was again near them. Shouts of laughter and even oaths followed. The laughter and the oaths came from those who were listening, and also from those who had heard nothing, but were simply looking at the figure of the discharged government clerk. "'To be pitied! Why am I to be pitied?' Mamelodov suddenly declaimed, standing up with his arm outstretched, as though he had only been waiting for that question. "'Why am I to be pitied, you say? Yes, there's nothing to pity me for. I ought to be crucified. Crucified on a cross, not pitied.' "'Crucify me, old judge! Crucify me, but pity me!' "'And then 
I will go of myself to be crucified, for it's not merry-making I seek, but tears and tribulation. Do you suppose, uh, you that sell, that this pint of yours has been sweet to me? It was tribulation I sought at the bottom of it, tears and tribulation, and have found it, and I have tasted it. But he will pity us, who has had pity on all men, who has understood all men and all things. He is the one. He too is the judge. He will come in that day, and he will ask, Where is the daughter who gave you herself for her cross, consumptive stepmother, and for the little children of another? Where is the daughter who had pity upon the filthy drunkard, her earthly father, undismayed by his beastliness? And he will say, Come to me. I have already forgiven thee once. I have forgiven thee once. Thy sins, which are many, are forgiven thee, for thou hast loved much. And he will forgive my Sonia. He will forgive, I know it. I felt it in my heart when I was with her just now. And he will judge and will forgive all the good and the evil, the wise and the meek. And when he has done with all of them, then he will summon us. You too come forth, he will say. Come forth, ye drunkards. Come forth, ye weak ones. Come forth, ye children of shame. And we shall all come forth without shame and shall stand before him. And he will say unto us, Ye are swine made in the image of the beast, and with his mark, but come ye also. And the wise ones and those of understanding will say, O Lord, why dost thou receive these men? And he will say, This is why I receive them, O ye wise. This is why I receive them, O ye of understanding, that not one of them believed himself to be worthy of this. And he will hold out his hands to us, and we shall fall down before him, and we shall weep, and we shall understand all things. Then we shall understand all, and all will understand. Katharina Ivanova even, she will understand. Lord, thy kingdom come. And he sank down on the bench, exhausted and helpless, looking at no one, apparently oblivious of his surroundings, and plunged in deep thoughts. His words had created a certain impression. There was a moment of silence, but soon laughter and oaths were heard again. That's his notion. Talked himself silly. A fine clerk he is. And so on and so on. Let us go, sir, said Marmeladov all at once, raising his head and addressing Raskolnikov. Come along with me, Kozel's house, looking into the yard. I'm going to Katarina Ivanova. Time I did. Raskolnikov had for some time been wanting to go, and he had meant to help him. Mamelodov was much unsteadier on his feet than in his speech, and leaned heavily on the young man. They had two or three hundred paces to go. The drunken man was more and more overcome by dismay and confusion as they drew nearer the house. "'It's not Katerina Ivanova I am afraid of now,' he muttered in agitation, "'and that she will begin pulling my hair. "'What does my hair matter? Bother my hair!' That's what I say. Indeed, it will be better if she does begin pulling it. That's not what I am afraid of. It's her eyes I am afraid of. Yes, her eyes. The red on her cheeks, too, frightens me. And her breathing, too. Have you noticed how people in that disease breathe when they are excited? I am frightened of the children's crying, too. For if Sonia has not taken them food, I don't know what's happened. I don't know. "'but blows I am not afraid of. "'No, sir, that such blows are not a pain to me, "'but even an enjoyment. "'In fact, I can't get on without it. "'It's better so. "'Let her strike me. "'It relieves her heart. "'It's better so. "'There is the house. "'The house, of course, of the cabinet-maker, "'a German well-to-do. "'Lead the way.' "'They went in from the yard "'and up to the fourth story. "'The staircase got darker and darker "'as they went up. It was nearly eleven o'clock, and although in summer in Petersburg there is no real night, yet it was quite dark at the top of the stairs. A grimy little door at the very top of the stairs stood ajar. A very poor-looking room, about ten paces long, was lighted up by a candle-end. The whole of it was visible from the entrance. It was all in disorder, littered up with rags of all sorts, especially children's garments. Across the farthest corner was stretched a ragged sheet. Behind it probably was the bed. There was nothing in the room except two chairs and a sofa covered with American leather, full of holes before which stood an old deal kitchen table, unpainted and uncovered. At the edge of the table stood a smouldering tallow candle in an iron candlestick. 
It appeared that the family had a room to themselves, not part of a room, but their room was practically a passage. The door leading to the other rooms, or rather cupboards, into which Amalia de Peveshel's flat was divided stood half open, and there was shouting, uproar, and laughter within. People seemed to be playing cards and drinking tea there. Words of the most unceremonious kind flew out from time to time. Raskolnikov recognized Katerina Ivanova at once. She was a rather tall, slim, and graceful woman, terribly emaciated, and with magnificent dark brown hair, and with a hectic flush in her cheeks. She was pacing up and down in her little room, pressing her hands against her chest. Her lips were parched, and her breathing came in nervous, broken gasps. Her eyes glittered as in fever, and looked about with a harsh, immovable stare and that consumptive and excited face, with the last flickering light of the candle end playing upon it, made a sickening impression. She seemed to Raskolnikov about thirty years old, and was certainly a strange wife for Mamelodov. She had not heard them, and did not notice them coming in. She seemed to be lost in thought, hearing and seeing nothing. The room was close, but she had not opened the window. A stench rose from the staircase, but the door on to the stairs was not closed. From the inner room clouds of tobacco smoke floated in. She kept coughing, but did not close the door. The youngest child, a girl of six, was asleep, sitting curled up on the floor, with her head on the sofa. A boy a year older stood crying and shaking in the corner. Probably he had just had a beating. Beside him stood a girl of nine years old, tall and thin, wearing a thin and ragged chemise with an ancient cashmere pelisse flung over her bare shoulders, long, outgrown, and barely reaching her knees. Her arm, as thin as a stick, was round her brother's neck. She was trying to comfort him, whispering something to him, and doing all she could to keep him from whimpering again. At the same time, her large dark eyes, which looked larger still from the thinness of her frightened face, were watching her mother with alarm. Marmeladov did not enter the door, but dropped on his knees in the very doorway, pushing Raskolnikov in front of him. The woman, seeing a stranger, stopped indifferently facing him, coming to herself for a moment, and apparently wondering what he had come for. But evidently, she decided that he was going into the next room as he had to pass through hers to get there. Taking no further notice of him, she walked towards the outer door to close it, and uttered a sudden scream on seeing her husband on his knees in the doorway. Ah! she cried out in a frenzy. He has come back. The criminal, the monster. And where is the money? What's in your pocket? Show me. And your clothes are all different. Where are your clothes? Where is the money? Speak. And she fell to searching him. Mamelodov submissively and obediently held up both arms to facilitate the search. Not a farthing was there. "'Where is the money?' she cried. "'Mercy on us! Can he have drunk it all? There were twelve silver roubles left in the chest!' And in a fury she seized him by the hair and dragged him into the room. Mamelodov seconded her efforts by meekly crawling along on his knees. "'And this is a consolation to me!' This does not hurt me, but is a positive consolation honoured, sir, he called out, shaken to and fro by his hair, and even once striking the ground with his forehead. The child asleep on the floor woke up and began to cry. The boy in the corner, losing all control, began trembling and screaming and rushed to his sister in violent terror, almost in a fit. The oldest girl was shaking like a leaf. He's drunk it! He's drunk it all! the poor woman screamed in despair. And his clothes are gone! "'And they are hungry, hungry!' "'And wringing her hands, she pointed to the children. "'Oh, accursed life! "'And you, are you not ashamed?' "'She pounced all at once upon Raskolnikov. "'From the tavern! "'Have you been drinking with him? "'You have been drinking with him, too! "'Go away!' "'The young man was hastening away without uttering a word. "'The inner door was thrown wide open, "'and inquisitive faces were peering in at it. "'Coarse laughing faces with pipes and cigarettes "'and heads wearing caps thrust themselves in at the doorway. "'Further in could be seen figures in dressing gowns flung open "'in costumes of unseemly scantiness, "'some of them with cards in their hands. "'They were particularly diverted when Marmeladov, "'dragged about by his hair, shouted that it was a consolation to him. "'They even began to come into the room. "'At last a sinister, shrill cry was heard. "'This came from Amalia Lipivashel herself, "'pushing her way amongst them, and trying to restore order after her own fashion, and for the hundredth time to frighten the poor woman by ordering her with coarse abuse to clear out of the room next day. As he went out, 
Raskolnikov had time to put his hand into his pocket to snatch up the coppers he had received in exchange for his ruble in the tavern, and to lay them unnoticed on the window. Afterwards, on the stairs, he changed his mind and would have gone back. "'What a stupid thing I've done!' he thought to himself. "'They have Sonia, and I want it myself.' but reflecting that it would be impossible to take it back now, and that in any case he would not have taken it, he dismissed it with a wave of his hand and went back to his lodging. "'Sonya wants pomatum, too,' he said as he walked along the street, and he laughed malignantly. "'Such smartness costs money, hmm, and maybe Sonya herself would be bankrupt today, for there is always a risk hunting big game, digging for gold. Then—' They would all be without the crust tomorrow except for my money. Hurrah for Sonia! What a mine they've dug there! And they're making the most of it. Yes, they are making the most of it. They've wept over it and grown used to it. Man grows used to everything, the scoundrel. He sank into thought. And what if I am wrong? He cried suddenly after a moment's thought. What if a man is not really a scoundrel, man in general, I mean, the whole race of mankind, then all the rest is prejudice, simply artificial terrors, and there are no barriers, and it's all as it should be. The end of part one, chapter two, of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Read by Rick Kistner, for lit to go on the web at fcit.usf.edu.